Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning again. Welcome again to Inspirational Wednesdays. Today is Wednesday, February the 18th, 2015. I am Pastor Al Kennett, and what a joy, what a privilege, what a honor it is to be able to join you as we come together to intercede on behalf of ourselves and behalf of those persons connected to us through prayer, that we are able to seek God's face, to seek his will will, to seek his assistance, to seek his intervention into whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through. And I tell you, that is such a marvelous privilege to be able to do that, to be able to do it with like-minded believers, to be able to do it in this place, in this space, where really there's no reason why there's anything that we can't get to God because the word says, where two or more are gathered, there shall he also be. We've got our two or more because I'm here, you you're here. The word says that's all we need. But we know that our God say he'll never leave us nor forsake us and that he will be with us to the end of all time. Now, when our God shows up, he doesn't show up by himself. He always comes in tandem with the son and the Holy Spirit. So really what we have here is the is five individuals, five persons, five essences that are ready to seek God. And so what we are going to do we're not going to waste any time. We're going to jump right on in it. We're going to have our opening morning prayer followed by a short devotional. And then we're going to get into what I call the best part of this call, which is a prayer session. It's called where we get to raise our prayer requests, our prayers, and our praise reports. So let's do this. Let's get, get it started. Let's have our opening morning word of prayer. Dear Father, God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we come to you right now, God, first thanking you for your sustaining grace and mercy, how you've kept us in the last seven days, how you watched over us, how you provided for us, how you protected us, how you did everything necessary so that we would be able to get back to this place this week so that we can offer you these prayers, these prayers, praise reports, and to raise our prayer requests. Now, God, we pray that for the next 50 minutes, minister so that you will be with us, that your spirit will rest, rule, and abide among us, and it will move through us so that, God, as we articulate our prayer concerns, our prayer requests, our praise reports, someone else's what someone else is going through, what someone else is dealing with, is connected to our prayer request. Someone re receives the uh, encouragement to keep pushing through by the praise reports we get. And God, we show just how much we need you by our determination to depend upon you, God. So with, it, with that said, God, do what only you can do during this time. Bless us and, and, and just do whatever you need to do so that your glory is is shown supreme here. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Our scriptorial focus for our devotional this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. Yeah, Cummings. Good morning, Brother Cummings. The the our, our our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, um, the fifth chapter, verses thirty-eight through forty-three. That's Mark chapter five. Verses 38 through 43, I'm going to read from the New International Version of the Scripture. The Word of God is as follows. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Thus far, the word of God. The title of this morning's devotional is Rising to Significance, Operating by Faith in the Midst of a Faithless Situation. Rising to Significance, Operating by Faith in the Midst of a Faithless Situation. As we've moved through Mark chapter 5 verses 21 through 43, I noticed something very peculiar in this pericope of scripture. At first, it escaped my attention because it's so marginally 
spectacular. In spite of its marginality, it captured my attention. Look at how Mark identifies Jairus. Starting with verse 21 and continuing on to verse 43, Mark distinguishes Jairus in the following way. One of the synagogue rulers, Jairus, and Jairus, the synagogue ruler. In fact, on four, or four separate occasions, Mark identifies Jairus as the synagogue leader. Now, I can hear what you're saying. You're probably saying four, four times. Is that it? Pastor Al, what's so peculiar about identifying Jairus as a synagogue leader on four different times? Well, I'm glad you asked. The narrative involving the woman hemorrhaging blood is intertwined with the narrative about Jairus' daughter. By combining these two separate narratives into one story, Mark utilizes the proper name Jairus only twice. However, the first gospel identifies Jairus as a synagogue leader four times. In a biblical story about faith that's as powerful and important as it is, Mark uses the descriptive identifier twice as much as it uses the proper name to identify Jairus' character. This small fact is important for us because the first gospel wants us to realize that Jairus isn't just another person living in that community beside the Sea of Galilee. Rather, we must specifically understand that Jairus is a leader within his community, and because of his socio-religious status, Jairus possessed an amount of importance that distinguished him from everyone else in his community. He was a member of the religious authority. He was responsible for the proper administration and operation of the local synagogue as well as for leading worship within his community. Being a synagogue leader elevated Jairus. He was supposed to possess significance in the midst of, uh, of commonality. You see, Jairus was one of God's under-shepherds. If, if a member of his community needed prayer, Jairus was the one that the member sought out. If a person needed spiritual advice about what the law was and how to, or how to apply it in specific situations, tribulations, and or adversities, Jairus was expected to provide the information that person needed in order to act in accordance with the law. For all intents and purposes, Jairus stood in a place of significance regarding the day-to-day -day life of his community. This meant that by default, he also possessed significance in terms of his community's political and socioeconomic existence. Yet, as central as a figure that he was to his community, Mark 5, Mark chapter 5 reveals that Jairus actually possessed no spiritual significance. As a leader of the synagogue, he was supposed to not only represent God to the world, but also to embody faith. The problem is that when his daughter was confronted with a life-threatening illness, Jairus became indistinguishable from the general masses that sought out Jesus. Here he was, one of God's ministers, operating with minimal to no spiritual significance at all. Is there any greater irony in life than when Christian disciples and stewards negotiate life's challenges, predicaments, and tribulations in the same way that the unchurched individuals in, that live around us do? As 21st century Christians, we're supposed to be immediate repositories of God's grace, mercy, and love. We're required to serve as paragons of faith. However, when the time comes for us to confront adversities and hardships, we're unable to care for ourselves in the midst of our sunshine rains. Now, those of us familiar with nature know that sometimes we experience storms. Among these storms are sunshine rains. These are rain showers where the sun shines brightly upon us as the surrounding clouds drop their rain. These rain showers are harmless. They pose no significant risk or threat of danger to us. They lack severity. Here is Jairus, a synagogue leader standing before Send before Jesus, lacking any significant spiritual authority. In other words, the rain, the, the sunshine rain has not Jairus off his course. 
You see, Jairus' issue isn't simply trying to remain faithful while helplessly watching his daughter slowly succumb to the ruthless, Ill, ruthless illness claiming her life. No, Jairus' issue is that he didn't possess the faith necessary to confront the death as it attacked his daughter. Rather, he, he, he can only fathom uh, in fact, he couldn't fathom, I'm sorry, any manner, means, or method to overcome death. All he could think of was to do what everyone else was doing. That to think that God was merely an intangible entity, inescapable of defeating this undeniable aspect of life. So what does Jairus need to do in order to rise to the level of significance that God requires of him? That's a good question. Here's another one. What can he do to actualize faith in the midst of death? And more importantly, for us, what can we do as God's 21st century disciples and stewards to rise to the level of spiritual significance that the Lord expects of us? I'm willing to bet that there are more persons that are living insignificant spiritual lives than there are persons living significant ones. Sadly, many of us are living lives devoid of the faith that transfigures unbelievers into believers and transforms the impossible into living miracles. You see, attaining true spiritual significance requires us to not only face, but also to confront and endure the world's ridicule. It wasn't easy to operate by faith in Jesus' world. That society was everything but faithful. If the truth be told, it isn't easy to operate by faith in our present world either. Today's world is just as faithless and cynical as Jairus' world was. Sharing with others just how we're expecting our Heavenly Father to do the impossible raises questions in the minds of others about our sanity. In fact, do this. Try telling someone that we're expecting God to transform a crack cocaine or methamphetamine addict into a fruitful, faithful member of the body of Christ. Many of our listeners will laugh at us in our face. They will accuse us of being the ones who are really smoking crack and or methamphetamine. Try telling someone that we're expecting God to cure a loved one of a deadly, life-threatening disease that the doctors have all but given up hope of ever curing uh, and restoring them to a picture of health. They will, these people will accuse us of not accepting reality and being so arrogant that we think we know more than the scientifically trained medical doctors treating this disease and or illness. Try telling someone that we're going to break the vicious cycle and not only attend college and or graduate school, but will be successful in operating in our professions that no one around us has ever done before. These persons will likely remind us that no one in our families have ever amounted to anything and that we're no different from anyone that's come before us. You see, when Jesus told the people in Jairus' house that his daughter was only moments away from being resurrected, they laughed at him. He was attempting to teach everyone present that those who die in the Lord really don't die a permanent death. Rather, they're only sleeping. They're waiting on the day of judgment where the righteous will be resurrected from death to live eternally in heaven with the Lord. The people in Jairus' house didn't understand Jesus. They only perceived what was in their grasp of understanding. Death was the end. Even life was, a for was forced to succumb to its reality. To understand that death isn't final required these persons to comprehend that there was an entity more powerful than death. This concept was nearly impossible for these persons to accept. In our own lives, our proclamations of faith engender ridicule from our audiences because they can't comprehend or conceptualize the myriad of possibilities that our Lord wants to realize in our lives. It's hard for some people to believe that an intangible God can overcome death and its very immediate tangible consequences. But as difficult as it is for others to conceptualize our expectations of faith, we must be ready to endure ridicule because they can't or are, or are unable to believe as we do. 
rising to significance, also requires us to step into adversity, ready to deal with it on its terms, but subject to God's authority. In the room where Jairus' daughter lay was significance. In order for Jairus to rise to the level of spiritual significance God expected of him, required him to go into that room to confront the adversity that eventually killed his daughter. It was only in confronting, ad confronting adversity that he's able to overcome it. But instead of confronting that adversity, Jairus ran from it in desperation and fear. Hence, this is why I believe that Jesus informed Jairus that he shouldn't be afraid, but should only believe when the men from his household brought him the news about his daughter's death. By requiring Jairus to believe and not fear, Jesus declared that he is the significance necessary to bridge Jairus to the faith he needed in order to overcome the adversity inhabiting his entire household. You see, we have to understand, it's just not Jairus' daughter that died that day. It was the faith of the entire household that died. And what Jesus is trying to get Jairus to realize is that he wants to be the bridge that takes him over the troubled water it wants to be the bridge that connects Jairus with the faith necessary to re eradicate the adversity in his house. What types of adversity inhabit our individual lives and prevent us from operating in, in spiritual significance? And more importantly, why are we so afraid of adversity? We are so fearful. Why are we so fearful to confront and resolve it? We say that we want to operate on a level of spiritual significance that transforms the lives of others. We say that we want to be super powerful lighthouses that shine the light of Christ in the dark world. But until we confront our, our adversities, we're, we will remain some distance away from operating with spiritual significance. But guess what? Just like Jairus, we have some help attaining the level of significance that has been beyond our reach for so long. All we have to do is to believe and not be afraid because our bridge over troubled waters is ready and willing to help us with our adversities. Amen. Let us have a closing word of prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we come before you seeking to understand why the significance we so long for has continually been beyond our reach. We worked hard to honor you, but each of us has come short of being what you called us to be. That's because thus far we're incapable of operating in the significance necessary to be truly transformative. We realize that there are some adversities that we've been running from. We've been afraid to be more Christian than our, than our adversities are difficult. But we know that in your son, Christ Jesus, we have an eternal bridge that connects us with the significance that you require of us. Therefore, we ask in prayer that you connect us with this significance so that we can be the instruments of change that you called us to be. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. We have just had our morning devotional, and it's important that we understand that we know that if we're going to rise to significance, if we're going to operate on a level of significance, we have to, have to address our adversities, our predicaments, our tribulations head on. We can't let them make us so fearful. We can't perceive them as being so powerful that we run away from them, that we doubt that God can do what he, do what he says he can do, that we disbelieve that God has the power to change these around. You know, the difference between where you are and where you want to be is simply what how you believe. If you believe that where you are, there's more, that God has more for you than what you are experiencing right now, you have already taken the first step to getting where you need to be. The problem for many people is we can't get past that first step. We can't believe that there's more for us in life than this. We can't believe that whatever we're up against can be defeated, can be destroyed, can be eradicated, can be removed, can be set aside, can be knocked down, can be pushed over, can be knocked over. We believe that we are up against some insurmountable walls, some unconquerable opposition, and because of that, we don't take the first 
step that God needs us to take so that he can take the next 10 steps for us. I believe that there are some folks on this call this morning that, that God has really been wanting to do some things in your life. He's been wanting to bless you. He's been wanting to, you know, elevate you. He's been wanting to promote you. But for whatever reason, there is something that you're fearing to do. It's it, it Maybe it's a, a, applying for that position. Maybe it's applying for that house loan. Maybe it's sending in the application to go back to school. Maybe it's not believing that if you create a budget that you can live by the budget. I don't know what it is, but God is saying that he needs us to take that first step and to believe. Don't be fearful. Don't worry about the ridicule. Don't worry about who's around. Just believe and take the first step and he will do the rest. All right. All right. This is what we're going to do. Let's transition now. Let's go from our devotional to the prayer section of our call. You know, I'm excited about today's prayer prayer section of the call, really today's call, and, and totally, because I believe that God has been doing such a wonderful, awesome thing in our lives and the lives of those connected to us that when we share our prayer requests as well as our praise reports, someone else on this call will be encouraged, will be edified, will be inspired, will be renewed restored will be we will be counseled someone here will get what it is they need so that they can walk in faith so that they can be an intercessor in the lives of other people so i just believe that we have a great prayer section of this call coming up because it's part of a great call and i believe god is going to do a wondrous mighty thing today uh, with us so this is what we're going to do we're going to open up the floor to prayer requests prayers or praise reports it does doesn't matter how big or how small the issue is. If it's troubling you or it's troubling some troubling someone connected to you, that is most definitely an issue that you need to raise in prayer so that God can receive it and deal with it and do what he needs to do so that we are blessed and he's glorified. Now, I hear someone saying, uh, if God is so omniscient, if God is so all-knowing, if God is so omnipresent, then why do I need to say anything to God about what I need prayer about or what someone needs prayer about. Well, the devil is a liar. The word is replete that God requires us to seek him out. He knows exactly what we're going through, but the requirement is from the old to first page of the Old Testament to the last page of the New Testament is that God requires us to seek him out and then those who seek him, he diligently rewards. He comes to uh, the rescue. He provides. He protects. He nurtures, he counsels, he restores, he rebuilds, he elevates. But we have to seek him. The word said, you have not because you ask not. You receive not because you search not. The door is never open for you because you never not. See, there's the requirement that we seek him. And once we do, the word is, he will do for us the very thing he has that we've asked him to do. Amen, amen. So let's get started. Give us your name where you you're calling from, and we'll go from there. And so if you have a prayer request, pray support prayer, just jump in, give us your name, where you're calling from, and we will uh, pray for you.